Thank you so much for joining this ninth open house session on Oaken. And it is actually the second open house session on Oaken 4.0. Uh, so first of all, let me thank you for the overwhelming response uh, to the first session. Uh, so many of you reached out. Uh, many of you want to be part of Wave 1 uh, in some kind of a capacity or the other. And we're going to reach out to all of you in the coming days and weeks uh, and figure out a way uh, to move forward on that. Second, many of you have asked questions. Uh, they'll all be answered. And uh, especially, you know, many of the tech questions will be answered today. Because today's open house session is meant for techies. Techies who are going to implement this within their own shop or are going to be implementing this as technology service providers, TSPs, uh, for others uh, so that they can go and sell this uh, technology to others. You know, essentially make an argument saying that we can get you started on Open very quickly. It's going to take you only a few weeks. Uh, but you'll have to pay uh, something for making that happen. So that's a business. Uh, so for both sets of people, today's session will be very useful. Uh, today, we shall be focusing on the architecture. We'll talk about the journeys. We'll talk about the APIs as well as, uh, you know, how can you get started? So these are some of the topics that we'll talk about. But before, before we get started with that, I like to spend a little time uh, setting the stage for Oaken. Um, you know, and of course, the easiest way to uh, understand in the conventional view is that since lots of data has become available through account aggregator and systems like that, high provenance data, uh, data-based lending has become possible. And this is indeed true. Uh, there, is, uh, there is nothing wrong in it. But over the last two years, we learned that that is only a necessary condition. That's not a sufficient condition. So what is this sufficient condition? The sufficient condition is, is really the fact that we have to focus on business loans, not consumption loans. Why? Because unlike consumption loans, business loans are useful even if they are short tenor. So if there is a MSME which has had a rocky few years and therefore it's not eligible uh, for a good working capital, one-year working capital limit, uh, they can still avail of a short tenor loan, cash flow short tenor loan, let's say for one quarter, and benefit from it, right? Because let's say you manufacture chairs, you can then buy the raw materials, put the chairs together, sell them, and that whole cycle is roughly a quarter cycle. Or you manufacture PCs, you can buy kits, manufacture PCs and do that. You can do that for ACs and so on and so forth. Uh, you can do that uh, if you're an MSME who is buying from a distributor and selling at retail, that kind of loan also benefits from short tenor loan. So short tenor business loans uh, become possible uh, and, uh, uh, and they are very useful. Uh, you know, but it doesn't solve the consumption loan problem, right? If, I've, if I haven't saved enough money to buy a washing machine and I want to take a loan uh, you know, to buy a washing machine, I would rather pay that off over two years, right? And uh, paying that off over two, three months does not really solve my problem. So that kind of consumption loan lending is not easily addressable, uh, you know, uh, in the current system. No amount of me providing data is going to change the fact that I have unstable salary income. And therefore, I'm not eligible for a long-term loan, right? And so BNPL is not something that we are focusing on uh, with Oaken at all. So having got this out of the way, that we are focusing on business loans to MSMEs and short tenor cash flow business loans, then the question that comes up is, and that these business loans, you know, as things stand today are not profitable, right? Uh, and why are they not profitable? Because, you know, if you give somebody a one lakh rupee loan for a year, and let's say your spread was 5%, so you made 5,000 rupees, a large chunk of that goes for cost of acquisition, cost of processing the loan, dispersing the loan, you know, in collections, in regulatory compliance. And, and if you are going to give that 1 lakh rupee as a loan only for a quarter, then you're going to make much less money. And, uh, and that less money 
uh, does not address the fact that your costs, these five costs that I described to you are fixed. I mean, whether you give a short-term loan or a long-term loan, these costs don't change with time, right? So we needed to work over the last two years to fix these five costs. And this is as much a business model issue as it's been a technology issue. And I'm happy to tell you that these costs have been fixed. They have been fixed in such a significant fashion that it is now possible for you to really be profitable with short-term loans and, uh, and short-term um, cash flow loans. And if you embrace these principles, as which you will hear about uh, in, uh, in the coming open house sessions, they're there already on oaken.dev as blog posts. If you embrace these ideas, then this large market uh, of potentially 17 lakh crores uh, opens up for you. Otherwise, you'll do experiments, they'll not work for you, and you'll be back to square one. So I wanted to kind of lay this foundation so that you are conscious of some of the challenges that you will face and how you will address them uh, as we go forward. So this is really what's been happening in the last two years. As you know, we did launch pilots with Oaken two years ago, and, uh, and these learnings from those pilots have found their way in how the playground is organized how the roles have been carefully laid out, uh, you know, and how those APIs have been uh, further improved so that uh, you can now be in a very profitable part of the business and make a lot of money as some Wave 1 partners are already starting to do. So this is really uh, the backstory uh, to this. Uh, some people say, hey, what's been keeping you from getting this uh, happening and and that is this learnings that have taken place. The first two years, you know, from UK Sinha uh, MSME report that came out in June of 2019 to July of 2021 was to get the basic framework ready. And in the last two years is really the substantive improvements that have happened uh, both in the tech and the business model. So we wish you luck uh, because we think it is ready for prime time now. And hopefully you'll be you'll be able to take adopt this with both hands and run ahead as you move forward. Uh, so so in the coming sessions, uh, you will hear about many of these things that I talked about. The next one, which will be next week, uh, will be about loan agents, borrower agents. As you know, the whole principle that we had to evolve was that you know your lender and the loan agents are remote, but there are some agents kyc collections disbursement that are uh, that are close to the borrower so there are some participants which are remote from the borrower and some participants that are close to the borrower so pay attention to that and in the next session we will be covering that and in the following session uh, we will we'll talk about the lenders and uh, and in fact even give away an underwriting model uh, that can be used by the lenders to get started, right? It's a house model, very useful uh, that you can use uh, right away. You don't have to wait for anything to get started uh, and and so on and so forth. So there'll be many more sessions that will be coming. So with that, uh, you know, let me hand it over to Sagar uh, to take it forward from here. Thank you, Sharad. Uh, that was a great introduction. Uh, in today's session, we are going to primarily cover three things. Uh, we have not particularly prepared a slide deck. Uh, we are going to walk through the documentation that has been created. So it is easy for people to navigate through what is being created. Uh, Arvind will walk you through the documentation and the text part of the sections where uh, all the API principles, terminology, uh, the workings and everything is described in a textual format. When, then we'll deep dive into the AV, APIs. The APIs uh, will be covered by myself and Monarch. And... Uh, we will cover the APIs uh, in the sequence of the journey, loan journey, and give as much details as possible on the front. We'll end the session with a small uh, piece of code, which uh, we've written as a team uh, to showcase how you can mock the APIs. We've constantly received requests to say that we require sandbox access and uh, uh, we are not able to start. And there's a cold start problem on how to do that. So to address that, what we've written is a small piece of uh, code in Node.js 
uh, which will probably help uh, get people started in how to mock the APIs for the other participants. So if you are a loan agent, you would probably mock the API for the lender and continue the rest of your code till you integrate in a SID kind of an environment, which we will uh, showcase in the upcoming open houses along with the registries. Having said that, uh, let me hand it over to Arvind, who's a fellow volunteer and has done a tremendous work in documenting everything on the website. Over to you, Arvind. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Sagar. So as Sagar mentioned, we will be um, going through all of the tech content using the uh, documentation that we have prepared. No slide decks today. Uh, the documentation is available at oken.dev. Um, we are not going to do a complete walkthrough of the documentation. Some of this obviously has intro to Oakland Food Auto and what it is about. We will instead look at very quickly uh, what are the different participant roles and components uh, to kind of set some uh, context to the technical conversation we are going to be having. And then we will do a deep dive into the different loan journey stages the APIs that are going to be involved in them and go over each and every API that is part of this entire Oaken platform, right? And then um, as Saga mentioned, we will also share uh, some details on how you can get started with implementing the APIs. Uh, very quickly, uh, kind of like a recap uh, from the previous Oaken sessions. In Oaken 4.0, what we have done is we have uh, increase the number of different specialized roles. Uh, the purpose obviously here is to enhance the system efficiency. So apart from just lenders and loan agent, the loan agent we refer to it as a LA or sometimes as a BA as a borrower agent. We now also have a derived data partner, a collections partner, disbursement partner and a KYC partner. These are different roles which are available in Oaken 4.0 that should help relieve the uh, work that needs to be done by the lender. In addition, there are also two non open participating registry roles. This includes the account aggregator framework and the traded guarantees. Uh, and we will look at uh, how all of these come together as part of uh, Oaken 4.0 into an uh, loan journey flow. Very quickly, then let's review kind of like what are the components we have uh, on Oaken. Uh, we, you can think of the Oaken 4.0 components as the registries, the services, and the APIs. What we have in terms of the registry is the participant registry and the product registry. Uh, these are uh, two registries where uh, the participants register themselves as they onboard onto Oaken platform. Similarly, any product that is created is also registered in the product registry. Uh, part of it is also to create a product network, which is a group of participants that will be serving the product, along with a lot of network policies on how the product is going to be served. Then in terms of the services, we have three services that are core uh, part of the Oaken platform. The first and the most critical one is kind of the auth service. This enables and ensures the security on the platform. We will do a deep dive on the auth service. We also have an analytics and heartbeat service where all the APIs are instrumented and uh, we are able to measure both the performance and monitor uh, the uh, loans which are being disbursed on the platform along with other activity that is happening on the platform. We also have a credit guarantee service. This is a proxy to the CGT MSE uh, service. This enables for verification of uh, credit guarantee eligibility for a borrower. So that is the other service that is part of Open 4.0. And then we also have all the APIs. So next we will be looking at a little bit more of a deep dive on the registries and the product network. Then we will look at the auth service. And then finally, we will do the deep dive on the Open 4.0 APIs. So in terms of the registries and the product network, as I mentioned earlier, we are introducing a participant registry as well as a product registry. So let's look at how participants get onboarded onto the participant registry. Uh, we have an SRO that will be uh, verifying and approving any participant who submits a request to uh, onboard onto Oaken. And uh, the verification and approval process by the SRO is the only requirement here uh, for the participants to be onboarded onto the registry. 
Then once you have participants, again, going back to the different participant roles, you might have lenders who are onboarded, you will have loan agents who are onboarded, as well as all the other uh, supporting participant roles uh, who have now been onboarded onto uh, the network. Now you have a notion of a product that is created by a lender, and you will have a loan agent who creates a product network and invites all the participants who come together to serve this particular product as part of this product network, right? Again, this is a process that we will go into in more detail in subsequent open houses. Uh, but the key thing to call out here is that we will be launching a UI portal where uh, the participants will be coming in and doing the registration process, both for a participant registration as well as for the product registration, network registration and management. All these APIs to uh, onboard onto the registry will also be available in case anybody wants to create their own uh, UI front end for uh, the same. Right now that we have had a quick look about the registries, let's also look at how these uh, product networks come together to really help scale uh, the goal for Oaken, which is to have a Cambrian explosion of products that serve all the different needs of the borrowers. Right, so. If we look at uh, this diagram here, let's start with one product at a time. Let's say that the product group or the product network begins with product one, right? So you have the loan agent one. I'll zoom in a little bit here. So you have the loan agent here, one, loan agent one, who creates this product with the help of uh, three different lenders, as well as a disbursement partner, escrow partner, and a derived data partner. So the loan agent then is the owner of this product network and all the uh, participants come together to serve this product to the borrowers of loan agent one. The loan, this is the first network that is created. You can very easily kind of see how uh, Oaken Food Auto is a network of network because the same loan agent can now start serving other products as well. Uh, here, for example, both product two and product three gets created by the same loan agent. And the loan agent may choose to have new participants who are serving the product, or there might be an existing participant from some other network who is also participating in this new network to serve the product, right? So this is kind of like an overview of how our product registries and the product networks will come through to have a network of network effect to serve different products in the network, right? So with that, uh, we finish the overview of the registries and the product network, and we'll look at the services and specifically the auth service. The auth service performs uh, two critical uh, functions on the Oaken platform. The first goal uh, with the auth service is to ensure that there is identity verification, where any entity, any participant that is engaging in terms of sending and receiving requests, they are all properly identified. The second goal with uh, the auth service is to ensure data integrity and non-repudiation where uh, an entity cannot refute uh, a request that was made by them. And the integrity and non-repudiation is uh, achieved through digital signatures, right? So let me very quickly kind of uh, share how the authentication is uh, established and ensured on the platform. So let's take, for example, a sample API request response flow. The authentication applies to every API request that happens on the platform. Let's say that you have an API client and you have an API provider and they both need to talk to each other, right? First, when the client is onboarded onto the platform, they will receive a client key, um, using which they will be able to create an access token. So the client will first talk to the auth service with the client ID and the secret key, which was given to them during onboarding, using which they are able to uh, create the token. And this access token is what they will be using subsequently in all of the API calls that are made by the client. So in any subsequent calls where the client, let's say talks to the API provider, now the API provider needs to validate the client and they do so by fetching a public key, which was also onboarded, uh, which was also uploaded by the client onto the participant registry, right? So the API provider will just 
fetch the certificate of the client from the participant registry. And using that, they will be able to validate that uh, they are indeed talking to the client. And then for any request with the access token, they can now um, send a response back post uh, the authentication of the client. In terms of onboarding and offboarding, as I mentioned earlier, first, the participant registry administrators will be um, helping with generation of the uh, client ID and the secret key and the public certificate and the uh, uh, public key of every participant is also uploaded onto the particip uh, participant registry. And the offboarding is again, somewhat similar where the admins are involved in uh, 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 helping uh, offboard a particular participant, right? So this is a simple overview of the auth service. Uh, and the goal here is to kind of give an overview of how these get used. There are two API endpoints as well as a lot more details here, um, which obviously you will be able to kind of follow through uh, from the documentation here. Instead, what we will now go into next is to cover all the Oaken 4.0 APIs. Before we go into the APIs that are part of the end-to-end -end loan journey, we will start with understanding what are the key design principles that we have applied for all the APIs. Um, in Oaken 4.0. Okay. So there are three key uh, design principles that we have followed. The first is that, that of an asynchronous design. By design, what we have is that whenever two participants are calling each other, when a participant sends a request, rather than having a synchronous response back, we have a separate API where the callee will return a response back to the caller after finishing the processing on their end, right? So how this will work is, let's say you have two participants, a caller and a callee. The caller sends an application request. Uh, immediately, the callee acknowledges that the request was received. Then the callee has time to process the request. And then when the callee sends back the response, the caller can acknowledge that the response was received again, right? In this particular case, um, the requests, all the requests and the responses share the request ID to indicate which is the request that is being uh, responded back to by the callee. This ensures that the callee will have enough time to process the request and we don't really have any timeouts and um, other issues in the system. The second design principle that we are following here is that of item potency, where all API operations are expected to be item potent. Again, the request ID parameter, which is included in every API call, will be used to dedupe any duplicate request that is sent by a caller to a callee. So for example, if there is a create loan application request that is sent by uh, the loan agent to a lender, if the request ID is exactly the same, then it indicates the same application which was sent earlier and the lender uh, end, they would just have to ignore this and send the same response that they had sent earlier as part of the create, create loan application response. Finally, in terms of security, we ensure that there is identification, uh, identity verification, data integrity and request non-repudiation. This is achieved using the auth service, which we kind of talked about earlier. With those design principles, let's kind of look at what how the end-to-end -end lo loan journey happens on the Oaken uh, 4.0 platform. Uh, for the sake of uh, putting some structure here, we have grouped them into seven stages. The first stage is the auth APIs. So these are a collection of APIs where uh, every participant is going to be talking to the auth service. Um, to enable authentication as part of every request call uh, that they need to make. Then you have the onboarding stage. Uh, this is primarily going to be a portal based as I indicated earlier. Uh, we can have UI portals uh, for the APIs that will enable both the product and the participant registry as well as the management of that and the product networks uh, which serve as a core backbone of uh, the lending flow. Then we have the core application processing of the loan application from the borrower. Here we have a loan application prep stage 
this is the stage where the loan agent will be ensuring that they have uh, credit guarantee information and anything else that may be required in the future to prepare the loan application. Then you have the auction process. Oaken 4.0 has the auction process where the application is now sent to all the lenders who are participating in the network, right? And uh, there will be a consent and a KYC. Uh, there, there will be a consent data underwriting done by each of the lenders who will then return back offers uh, to the loan agent. Once the offer is uh, forwarded to the borrower and the borrower picks the offer uh, from a specific lender, we switch into the offer selection through disbursement stage. Here, these are uh, APIs between uh, the loan agent and the single chosen lender. Uh, the, the APIs include uh, things for KYC, for loan agreement, uh, and the repayment and disbursement setups. Once the loan agreement and disbursement uh, setup is completed, the core loan application uh, flow is complete in the sense that these are the these are uh, steps that are done in sequence. Post disbursement, we have a separate stage where you have APIs that can happen out of sequence. Finally, we have also grouped the partner APIs as a separate set of APIs because these are optional in terms of how a particular network product network is configured. So if you have, for example, a collections partner or a disbursement partner, then these APIs come into effect. If not, uh, the lender uh, will uh, already be performing these steps as part of the offer selection to disbursement journey. Let's very quickly, we've already looked at the auth APIs and how that is done. So very quickly, let's look at the rest of the uh, stages. So for the onboarding stage again, um, that is the participant registration, the product creation and the product group creation. We've already touched on this earlier and this will be uh, done from a UI portal. So this is the loan application prep stage. Here we have the Oaken component, Oaken service, which is the Oaken credit guarantee service. Uh, the borrower initiates a loan application and then the loan agent will call the check credit guarantee API to confirm whether there is eligibility for the borrower or not. And the eligibility information will then be subsequently used as part of the loan application. Now, this is the loan application auction and offer stage where this is a one to many, one to many because you have one loan agent that is now going to talk to multiple lenders in terms of submitting the loan application and receiving offers from each of them. So if you look at what happens as part of this, you have first the uh, create loan application request. So in this example, you have lender one and lender two, two different lenders who are part of the product network. Uh, both the lenders are forwarded the loan application from the loan agent. Both these lenders will then be performing uh, an uh, uh, underwriting process for which they would need data from account aggregator. So there is a user consent flow that happens. Here the consent is uh, consent request and response is gotten from the lenders and then the loan agent will initiate the consent with the borrower. Once the consent is there, uh, the loan agent will then forward the response back to uh, the lenders, right? In the meantime, if the lenders need a status request and response on the consent, they may be able to do so. We'll look in detail about how these consent APIs will work. Finally, once the underwriting has been completed by the lenders, they will then be issuing the loan offers. So again, all the loan offers go back to the borrower from lender one as well as lender two in this example. And uh, the borrower then selects a particular offer. In this case, the borrower is picking the uh, offer from lender two by setting the offer request and getting an offer response. At this point, we switch from this one to many stage uh, into the next stage where it is going to be a one to one where the chosen lender and the borrower are going to complete the loan application flow. So here we have uh, five groups of APIs. Once the set offer request has happened between the borrower uh, and the lender via the loan agent, the first 
uh, next step is to do the KYC. So the KYC may be done directly by the lender or with the help of a KYC partner as indicated here. Um, after the KYC is completed, then there is the loan acceptance stage where there is uh, the contract and the agreements which are uh, shared and uh, there is OTP-based authentication that is done by the borrower uh, once they accept the terms to complete the loan acceptance. Once the loan has been accepted, then on the lender end, the lender now creates a loan in their system that is then indicated by way of the grant loan uh, application APIs. Subsequently, the next uh, step would be to initialize the repayment plan uh, with the set repayment plan request responses. Uh, again, uh, where the uh, borrower is able to select what is the plan that they would request here. Finally, you have the disbursement. The disbursement again happens between uh, the lender and the borrower. And if there are partners involved for disbursement or for uh, collections, those partners will also be involved as part of the partner APIs, which we will get to in a bit. Right? So with the completion of the disbursement, now you have two types of post disbursement APIs. These can happen anytime after the loan disbursement has happened, uh, which is why we group them in a separate stage. Uh, the repayment uh, done by the borrower is the first uh, stage here where the borrower will be uh, triggering the repayment request. And uh, the repayment may happen within our system or outside, in which case the lender will also inform the loan agent with a confirmed repayment request. Again, we'll look into details on this in the APIs. Finally, you, at any point of time where the loan details are needed, the borrower may initiate uh, a request here to get the loan summary, loan statement, uh, or other information about the loan, which, which again can be uh, fetched from the lender via the loan agent. And then finally, we have the partner APIs where depending on whether you have a derived data partner, KYC partner, disbursement partner, or a collections partner, all these different parties are involved as part of uh, the end-to-end -end loan journey. With this, we kind of complete an overview of how these different stages are uh, grouped in our uh, platform. Uh, I'll now pass this over back to Sagar, who will kind of go over the API section here and do a walkthrough of the different APIs. Thank you, Arvind. Uh, thank you for the detailed introduction to how the documentation is structured and how the APIs are done. I'm going to share my screen and uh, walk over the APIs. So uh, the APIs are available under the API section. Uh, we have grouped them into kind of the four groups, the seven out of the four groups, the three stages within the journey APIs are all listed at the same thing, but the other three groups remain the same. The auth service, how to generate a access token, how to get a certificate. Again, this service uh, will be launched along with the portal. Uh, for now, if you were to skip this step, you can pretty much skip this step, uh, to do this, the participant registry, uh, to get the details of a particular participant, which is the IP certificates, public, uh, they are, they are public IP and the token, which they will send the request from. So the listing IP and white listing IP, all the details will be available here. The product registry APIs are to fetch the product, uh, to find the network participants, whom to call, whom not to call, uh, are available within these APIs. I'm not going to delve into it much in detail. When we register to the registry, uh, we'll walk through all the APIs in detail. Uh, the, the focus of today is to get people started on the journey APIs, right? So, uh, before we, uh, delve into the APIs, I'd like to mention a few points, uh, the APIs are designed with a pattern. So if, if you go into any of the APIs, uh, there is a request and there is a response and you will have a subsequent status where if there is nothing received in between each of the, either of the participant depend on who's the initiator of the request or who's the receiver of the request can go ahead and do a status check on where the API has been. Uh, making the APIs async also brings up a lot of possibilities on uh, how the journey can be designed. For some reason, if uh, any uh, 
BA wants to do an offline handover of a, to a particular participant in case of a KYC or in case of collections or in, or in case of disbursements. Uh, the APIs are async in nature, which means that uh, the request can be initiated and the response can come in an async manner. So if there is an offline handover, uh, it can happen. The third thing that we uh, want to mention is the partner APIs uh, and some of the other APIs that are there are just wrapper APIs of how you will talk in a common language. Uh, like for example, if uh, we were to talk about KYC, uh, it's a specific pattern in which uh, the APIs are designed. You initiate the KYC with a partner or with uh, from a borrower agent to a lender, and there is a complete KYC with a status, whether it is completed, accepted or rejected, right? Uh, with the partner, it remains the same. It doesn't get into whereabouts how the KYC is done. So it could be multiple models. You could use the DG locker. You could use any KYC models that you are existingly using, or if you uh, don't have those uh, KYC methods that work within a particular network, you could leverage the services of the partner. All the four partners are uh, the derived data partner, the KYC partner, the disbursement partner, and the collections partner are going to be effectively working for the lender with an exception of the derived data partner who's an independent database where the lender might query for a fee. Uh, they're all lender agents. So the lender might or might not choose any of these partners. They would just go ahead with their flow if they have the flow which works. Uh, starting with the credit guarantee API, uh, this is a pre-flight check uh, on the network with the appropriate access token. You could hit the service. And uh, based on the service, uh, you could pass in the PAN number, UDM number, and the GST number. This is for now going to return the CGT MSE eligibility check. Uh, so after the, on the application, whether it's a mobile application or the web application, the borrower fills in the request, uh, take that, the loan agent will take that request and pass it to the credit guarantee service and the credit guarantee service will return the eligibility. That eligibility along with the loan application is passed to the lenders. So the lenders, when they receive the loan offers, they know that this application is CGTA MSE eligible. The create loan application is the first loan application in the system. Uh, it captures the entire uh, details of the borrower and what is the loan, loan details that are required and so on and so forth. The pledge documents is a place where any document, whether it is a GST, GST and certificate, whether it's a purchase order, whether it is any other document, uh, which is used as a proof to get, uh, which is a proof of future income to get a loan, uh, is going to go into the DDU registry. So this pledge document will, uh, go into the DDU registry and, uh, any loan against this document, any counter loan against this document, which is attempted, uh, through another network or anything can be looked upon on the DDU registry. The create loan application is a response uh, with a status whether the application was successful or there was an error processing the application from the lenders. At this point in time, the loan agent will wait for all the lenders to go ahead and respond back. Uh, they will set up, we mentioned network policies and we'll delve into network policies in detail in the future open houses. But at this point in time, the one of the network policies would be a timeout that would be set by the network owner, which is the loan agent. where. They own the UI, they own the journey, they own the experience of the borrower. They would set up an appropriate timeout and the lender has to appear for it. So after that timeout that is being set uh, on certain APIs with respect to uh, offers and things like that, uh, the loan agent might not wait for the response if it exceeds the timeout. So once the loan application is received, uh, again, we'll get into the product registry in later open houses, but the product would define whether it requires a A journey or no. If the A journey is required, uh, the loan agent collects the VUA, which is the account and account aggregator handle, either via registration flow or via login, uh, sends it to the lender. The lender against the VUA creates a consent ID. Uh, the consent handle will be passed back to the borrower. Uh, the borrower agent aggregates all the consent handles from all the lenders and shows it in a single view to the borrower via the account aggregator interface. Once the account aggregator, uh, once the account aggregator action has been taken, whether the consent has been given or rejected, uh, the journey status is being shared by the loan agent to the lender. So the consent handle request describes uh, from the, in, initiates from the 
borrow region with the VUA of the borrower to the lender. The response will return a consent handle, which is a consent aggregation ID and a consent handle with a consent status as well. You could look up the attributes more in detail. And the status, uh, after the consent is given, the borrower agent will go ahead and check the status against the lender where they have received the consent and they can move on to the next part of the journey. And this status pattern and the async action pattern is what you will follow in every section. So uh, we might just go over very quickly towards the end of this in the same pattern. Uh, the shared consent journey status is also uh, an API that after redirected back from the account aggregator, the borrower agent might inform the lender that the, the user has taken an action on the consent and uh, that will be an indication to the lender as well. After the consents are being given, uh, the next stage is the offer request. So at this point in time, the BA redirects to the offer screen, makes a request to the lender to send the offer. So this requests go to multiple lender. The lenders might or might not choose to return an offer. The ones who successfully underwrite the application or feel the application is good enough, they return an offer. The BA uh, collates all the offers, hopefully via a good user interface, uh, navigates the user into selecting the best offer. The best offer not always might be the highest amount offer or the lowest interest rate offer. It could be a combination. And at this point in time, when we call a BA, I'd like this time to highlight uh, what is the purpose of a BA. But BA is an agent of the borrower. They might help navigate the user to select the best offer in terms of all the three attributes, which is the tenor, which is the interest rate and the amount of loan, which they require. They might not require the amount of loan that is being offered. The generate offer response usually ends with an offer, but in some cases, if there is any additional data required, uh, it would end up with a action, uh, either with a status or it would end up with a action required. Uh, so I just have to scroll down for the block action required. So if any additional document required, for some reason, if the A journey did not get through, any additional document is required, uh, this action required block would be having a status and uh, add document and the description of what the document is required. So the BA might create this screen to add the document and the user uploads the document and it is being shared with the lender in the send additional documents request. And the send additional required response would have the details, whether it is another, any additional document, this could pretty much go in on, on a loop. At this point in time, the offers are rendered and uh, you would end up with a set offers request. So the borrower picks the offer with a particular lender. Every offer has an offer ID, unique offer ID. Uh, so this offer ID is kind of selected by the borrower where they want to go ahead with the journey and complete the loan process. And uh, the offer response acknowledges that the loan application status is created. Uh, with this, I will hand it over to Monar. Uh, from here, the journey pretty much funnels into a single lender journey where a particular offer is kind of selected by the borrower and the borrower wants to go ahead and apply for the loan. He would walk through the parts of the KYC uh, till the loan details um, and I'll cover the partner APIs in detail. Partner APIs are pretty much uh, the four KPIs which happen in between the journeys when the lender chooses to activate one of the partners. But we'll look at them in detail. So we'll discuss the fork when we discuss the partner APIs at what point the fork happens. Uh, with this, I'll hand it over to Monarch, who's done a lot of work on the APIs and getting the API in a very nice documented format up and running. Uh, thank you, Monarch. With this, I'll hand it over to Monarch. Uh, thanks, Raga. Thanks a lot. So let's start with the KYC folks. After the offer has been selected, the next step is the KYC. Now, KYC has been divided into the two parts. The first is the triggering the KYC, and second is the status of the KYC. Now. BA can trigger the KYC request with the lenders and with all the necessary information. And we have a two types of the KYC, individual and entity KYC. Now, upon the receiving the request from the BA, a lender can either choose to perform the KYC by themselves or they can choose the partner if, if of the network. Now, a KYC uh, upon the success, successful KYC, even if it's a successful or a rejected, a lend, lender should will call the trigger KYC response to the BA with the necessary information regarding the status and all. In the meantime, uh, BA can always check the latest KYC status with the lender 
by calling the KYC status API. The next step into the journey is a loan acceptance. Loan acceptance has a, a three steps. And first is a, getting the agreement ready. Now, uh, VA can request the loan agreement uh, to the lender by passing the loan application ID and lender will send the information back and it has a two status. The first is agreement ready and the second is action required. And upon, if the status is action required, there are multiple actions which can be such as adding the document or resubmitting or sending a more additional data to keep the document ready. Once this, uh, once the dates, additional data has been submitted and the status has been to agreement ready, uh, you, uh, BA can show the agreement to the borrower and upon the successful, uh, they can trigger the, uh, trigger loan acceptance request. And here, uh, there will be OTP based authentication. So first OTP trigger will happen. And then upon that, a uh, successful, uh, verification of the OTP can be done. This OTP will be sent by the lender and, uh, will uh and borrower will add the otp on the bs application the next part of this journey is a grant loan now grant loan is a, a very important api in this journey where uh underwriting of the loan will be taken place into the lender system where lender will generate the loan id and it will send it as a part of the response and with other necessity information so from now onwards there will be two identifiers first is a loan id and second is a loan application id once the loan ID has been generated, then comes the next step, next step about the setting up the repayment plan. Now repayment plan has a two information. First is a setting up the plan. And second is a whether the BA has a collection support or not. If the BA has a collection support, they can send this uh, flag as a true. And other information related to plan, which they can fetch it from the selected offer. Now upon the successful request, a lender will send the res response back to the BA with a plan information, a payment method information, which is a preferable payment method of the lender. And it will have a different kind of a payment method, such as an e-mandate, uh, yeah, e-mandate, e-nation, e all the necessary information, necessary information to complete that payment. And the uh, use collection support or not. If lender wants to use a BS collection support, then they can send this value as a true. Now, of course, it has a status API so that BA can always get to know the latest status of the repayment plan. After the repayment, the next step is the disbursement. Now, if a, a BA has a collection support and lender wants to use a collection support, then here BA can create the account and uh, or they can, if the collection support is not there or lender doesn't want to use a collection support, they can pass on the account information of the borrower in this API and they can uh, call this API on a lender side. And upon the successful receiving the request, lender can all uh, send the request back with a different information regarding the uh, account information and other necessary information, such as a, has other working capital account or not. And upon the receiving, the next step is the triggering the disbursement request, which will be called by the lender on the BA to trigger the disbursement. And here is all the payment information will be sent from the BA. And of course, and we have a status APS, which can be used by the BA to get the necessary information and the status at any given point of time. Now here, the marks the end of the post, uh, post offer selection till the disbursement journey. Now there are other two APS, which are such a trigger repayment and loan details. Let's deep dive into the loan details. Loan details are simple fetch data APS, such uh, where uh, BA can fetch the loan statements, loan summary, uh, loan details from the lender's side. And there is another API, uh, no, which is a trigger repayment, payment APS. Trigger repayments API will be uh, triggered by the BA on the lender. And this API should not be called if the, uh, if the uh, BA is not a collection agent. And with all the necessary information, BA will call this payment, uh, BA will call the payment API with all the payment information to the lender and on a uh, lender will return the successful response to it. If, uh, if the BA wants to know the uh, status of the, any previous repayments, which has been done, then they can call the trigger repayment status APS and in a, sub in, a sub in a response to it, the lender will send the response back. There is a one more API, which is a confirmed repayment request. If a lender got the, um, repayment directly into his account via the automated e-bandit flows or a offline payment on any of the collection branches, then they, sh they can call this API to inform the B about the repayment. 
Now this marks the end of the all the APIs between the BA and lenders. Now let me hand over to the Sagar to walk you through about the partner APIs. Sagar, over to you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Monar. Uh, thank you very much for covering the details, API in details. Uh, before we go into the partner APIs, uh, I'd like to mention a couple of more things which uh, are very important. These APIs will remain same for all the products. So we've uh, tested these APIs under a variety of use cases. So the journey uh, wouldn't change significantly. What it means for a borrower agent is that they could skin their journey or interchangeably change some sections of it. For a lender, they don't have to integrate. When they go onto a network, uh, they pretty much need to uh, only change the underwriting model that will be required with the under uh, with the derived data partner and the network data that is available on the network. Uh, this will help uh, speed up the integration process significantly. The other things, uh, these APIs are meant to handle all kinds of products and all kinds of sections. So we have an extensible data block, which is available almost on all the APIs. Any additional data that is not present in the standard API uh, can be passed along between participants on the extensible data block. Uh, this, uh, if it is done enough and some data that is there, which is kind of uh, applicable to all the loan products, we might consider putting them back into the API. Uh, but for one off use cases or for a, some use cases, you could use the extensible data to pass on the information that is not existent on any of the APIs especially things like create loan application and things like that, which are required, which are very specific to the product. So these extensible data blocks are almost everywhere on all the APIs. You could leverage them for your specific use cases. Let's start with the derived data partner. Uh, the derived data partner APIs are broken down into two things. One is to fetch the schema. Uh, the lender might choose to uh, cache the schema once the schema is there. So what will happen is the lender would query the derived data partner uh, with the product ID and the product network ID. Based on the product and the product network ID, uh, the derived data partner or the data provider would return available list of available schemas. This schemas could fetch from satellite data to land records to uh, history on a particular B2B portal. In case of gem, there is gem data that is available, the vintage data that is there in the portal, aggregated transaction, all, all kind of data that is available. Uh, this, and there could be multiple of those available within the network. So there are schemas that are returned. Each, each schema has a schema ID, which can be used to query the specific schema with identifiers. Identifiers would be unique IDs on that system. So it's my previous example, if I would take land records, possibly it would be the land record number, or if I take satellite data, it could be the, uh, the coordinates, the lat long coordinates or some geofenced coordinates that are there as an identifier. So we've, we've kept that as an open array. Uh, there could be as many, um, as there. The lender can query the derived data partner with the identifier with, with the schema ID and the identifier. This could fetch the results of the schema. The response is an open object. Like we said, we've only created wrapper APIs. So this response is dynamic based on what schema is being there. Uh, the lender might go through it once in the SIT environment, parse it, write their parsers for this and consume it in their underwriting engine. From there, cash on to the relevant uh, systems. Right? So the second is the initiate KYC partner request. This we mentioned that there's a fork in the KYC journey. So if, uh, when the BA calls the lender for KYC, uh, if the KYC, if the lender does not want to use the existing KYC mechanism that they have, and they want to leverage the network for say a physical verification or a BC or any of the use cases that might exist in the future, this is up for innovation. Uh, the lender is going to initiate the KYC request with the partner is the same model as that of the KYC, but this is happening between the lender and the KYC partner, the initiate request and the initiate response, the KYC partner status request and the response is initiated from the lender to the partner. So when the, if the request, which is going from the loan agent and the KYC is being kind of transferred to the KYC partner, the loan agent, which is the LA might 
request the status on the lender, the lender might request on the KYC partner, and the request would propagate it back to the loan agent. This enables a variety of use cases, whether it's a digital flow or a digital flow or any of the flow. These are just wrapper APIs with the loan application that is there. So the KYC partner can get the appropriate details to do the things. The disbursement partner. Uh, disbursement partner is specifically introduced in the system to get uh, a purpose control product. Uh, the purpose control product uh, could be example would be to buy fodder for cattle. Uh, to buy a tractor for a farmer, to buy materials, to buy any purchase related use cases, to buy machinery or any of those things. So the job of a disbursement partner, this could be performed. So one thing I would uh, take a pause here and mention is uh, one participant could do multiple roles. The reason why we've broken the roles is that they allow for multiple participants to be doing it. So many cases, the LA might also do the job of the disbursement partner as well. So in this case, uh, we are looking at a catalog request. Uh, the disbursement partner will integrate where the purchase is going to happen. Uh, the catalog request initiates to return a catalog of what are the available products or services that are there with the uh, end user uh, who's going to be purchased or who's going to be selling to the borrower. The response uh, returns some sort of products and services. The finalized order is kind of the e-commerce flow of a cart. Uh, Sharad mentioned in his previous use cases, this might seem like a buy now pay later, but it's a disbursement uh, use case. Uh, it can be used for buy now pay later. It could be used for consumption, but this could be used for investment. So this could be like buying a, a sewing machine or it could be buying some sort of a machinery or any sort of uh, products like a distributor, uh, a retailer buying from a distributor. These options are returned uh, and the finalized cart is being sent back. At this point in time, the response is coming back from the uh, loan agent to the person, uh, to the disbursement partner on what is the order ID and the required details. This order ID, uh, the amount and everything will be fulfilled at the time of disbursement. So the disbursement, this order ID, this account and everything will be passed on from the disbursement partner to the loan agent. And at the time of disbursement where the set disbursement account request goes on, the disbursement account would be set and the money instead of going to the borrower would go to the person who the borrower is buying from. This marks the end of the disbursement APIs. This journey will be more clear in upcoming open houses where we will present the journey. Next, we come with the last partner that's a collection partner. Uh, the first API will be the setup collection account uh, API. So this would be used in case of escrow. Uh, where the buck is passed on to the collections partner to create an escrow account and return an escrow account details in return. This could be not just an escrow account. It could be a, a wallet or a PPI wallet or any sort of other uh, mechanism where uh, money could be held. The trigger collection request is initiated by the lender to the collection partner on the day of collection to be done. Uh, the response is returned by the lender with the appropriate uh, success messages or the error messages with the appropriate status. The get payment methods and the get payment method response is the payment methods that are available on the collections partner, whether they support a EPIE mandate or they support a EDN or any sort of other mechanisms. And uh, they, are, they will be passed on at that point in time. The trigger repayment status and response are the status APIs that we've been hearing through all the sections. These are kind of the check APIs from the lender to the collections partner to check the status of where the collection is. With this, uh, we mark the end of the APIs. If you have any suggestions, if your use case is not met through it, feel free to get in touch with us on the form that is being shared in one of the previous open houses. It's, it's also available on okim.dev. If you go to the top right corner, there's a contact form here and you want to get in touch with us, whether you want to be a participant, whether you want to be a volunteer. Arvind mentioned about the registries. Uh, for now, 
uh, please fill up the form. We'll get in touch with you for your documents and verification, and we'll onboard you to all the registries manually and send your, send out your client credentials. We'll be launching the registries and the sandbox environment in upcoming open houses. Uh, so hold on for that. One of the most asked questions was, how do we get started with OKN? And this is kind of a cold start problem. Uh, I would say that 95% of it is API integration. 5% uh, of it is uh, the UI creation of your client ID credentials and uh, participating in product networks. But once you have the product network, if you look at the any of the APIs uh, on the journey side, uh, it is expecting, uh, I'm sorry, it is expecting a product ID and a product network ID. This could be faked for now to finish the journey because that's 95% of the work especially on the BA front, uh, the, the entire journey APIs are complete uh, and you could use them. So the product ID and product ID, network ID could be faked. Uh, I've written a small application that will walk through how we can, uh, how we can kind of fake the request on both the ends. So here we have uh, some of the library imports. Uh, we have uh, data which is dummy data for the request of create loan response uh, i've copied that from the portal you could fill in whatever the mock values are or you could write a function to return these values on a dynamic basis or random basis that is up to you how you want to test your things uh, here the lender is going to listen to the create loan request so at this point in time uh, it returns a simple 200 response with a trace ID and a timestamp. But I've set up a timeout function. This timeout function is going to take the previous mentioned data and after one second, respond back to the loan, loan agent application with the data that was present in this file. So if I am developing the loan agent application and uh, Again, this is basic library imports running on our 3002 port. I would listen to the post from the create loan response and the lender would return that data. So if I were to run this uh, application, uh, so I have both the applications running uh, here into the terminal. I'm going to just simply run the application of the borrower to show the pause and I'm going to hit the lender request with the thing. I'm assuming this is going to come from the journey. So at this point in time, I did receive a request response back. So if I see the trace IDs on my app, I, as a lender, I did receive all the data that was there, the data that was passed as a part of the create loan application. And uh, at the response stage, I did receive the response back. This is how you could go and mock any participant APIs. And this, a this method can be used to test variety of scenarios in your development environment. Uh, we will be providing an SAT, SIT environment where all the participants get together and test their thing and move it to UAT environment where users are going to be able to test it. Uh, with that, uh, if there are any questions, any things that you find uh, which do not fit your use case, or if you want any improvements in the APIs to match your use case, please feel free to write us. And uh, thanking everyone for patiently listening to all the content here. Apart from three of us, there have made many other volunteers who contributed to this. And I'd like to thank all of them. Uh,